Welcome to our webinar on the essentials of Sharpie impact testing. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Nick Erickson, your host for this webinar. Today, I'm joined by JJ Blankhorn, one of Instron's application engineers within our High Force static testing team. JJ works within, with our High Force universal testing frames. These are systems with capacities ranging from 100 kilonewtons to 2,000 kilonewtons. And he also works, works with our larger motorized pendulum impact testing systems that are used for Sharpie impact testing. Um, we're also joined by Stefan Botsky, another member of our High Force applications team. Stefan will be working behind the scenes with me while JJ is presenting to keep an eye on questions. Uh, this presentation should take around 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll wrap up with some questions. And I just want to mention real quick that you can submit your questions at any time during the presentation using chat. So with that said, I'm going to turn things over to JJ. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is JJ Blankhorn, and I'll be presenting today's webinar on Sharpie Impact Essentials. So with that, let's get started. So today, this is a little bit of an agenda of what you're going to learn. Uh, first, we're going to look at Sharpie Impact Test, or what Sharpie Impact Testing is and the results that it produces. We're going to look at some real examples of why Sharpie testing is important, some tips and important details about ASTM E23 and ISO 148, and also how you can improve throughput and efficiency in your impact testing. So to get started, let's look at what impact testing is. First we, can first, we can define impact. It's the action of one object coming forcibly into contact with another. In mechanics, this impact is classified as a high force applied over a short period of time. Accelerated force usually has a larger effect than a, than a force applied over an elongated period of time. When we test with impact machines, the result that we are looking to gain is absorbed energy. To get this result, our machine options are generally a pendulum frame, like the one you see on the right here, or a drop tower. For the webinar today, we're going to focus on the Charpy test, which is completed with a pendulum tester. The way that a pendulum machine calculates absorbed energy is by understanding its original angle that it's sitting at and then comparing it to the final angle after the swing. To get an accurate measurement, you will need to account for windage and friction loss. And depending on your machine, you'll either cali calibrate this manually or you may choose an option that can calculate and calibrate this automatically. Another important result from these tests that, that needs to be recorded is the failure type. This is represented as a brittle or a ductile failure. So while the technology for how the pendulum strikes the specimen has remained more or less unchanged, testing systems like the one you see here on the right, they have presented itself with frequent challenges for many operators and companies, but we'll get into some of that later. And then lastly, before we move on, I just wanna tell you to keep in mind this large center dial that you see on the frame here. And just keep that in the back of your head for later on. So we're going to have a little fun with some movie trivia just to make sure the comments are working properly and we can see the audience engagement. So the question is, um, in the film Titanic, Jack is handcuffed to a pipe after being framed for stealing the heart of the ocean diamond. What does Rose use to free him? Is it A, a key, B, an ax, or C, she didn't and left Jack there so she could escape on a lifeboat. So we'll just see if we get any answers coming in on the comments here, make sure everything's working properly. All right, so the answer to this question is B in X, and it's a good thing that the answer wasn't C because this certainly would have made the movie a little less anticlimactic. So we're going to ask another question here, and this is more related to trophy testing, and it's going to be on ductile and brittle specimens. So on the left, we have a broken specimen. Uh, would you classify this failure as brittle or ductile?
So the answer here, and although we can't perfectly analyze the specimen just from looking at this picture, um, it's safe to say that this is more aligned with a brittle failure. You can see the brittle and ductile if you want to look at them comparatively. And if you see on the right, the more ductile failure is certainly more smooth and isn't as um, dy dynamically cracked as the brittle one on the left. So why is that exercise important? And this is depending mostly on the standard, but it's likely that the operator testing impact will need to determine this type of failure visually. And this is a very important uh, result in your impact testing. ASTM E23 indicates that the fracture type is to be visually analyzed and recorded as a percentage value. So today's real world application will focus on the Titanic. So most, if not all of us are very familiar with the Titanic story. It was the largest ship ever built for its time. It was on course to arrive in New York and make a lot of headlines. And ironically, was largely considered to be unsinkable. But as we know, the ship never made it. Titanic struck an iceberg on its maiden voyage and 1,500 lives tra were tragically lost. So for some of us that may be extra familiar with the story, there were a surprising amount of actions that factored into the, the Titanic's tragedy. Um, you may know that it was going too fast or there were iceberg warnings that were dismissed, uh, lookouts weren't properly equipped, and of course, not enough lifeboats on the ship itself. But how does this relate to impact testing? So when the Titanic struck ice, the hull of the ship failed brittily and such early testing should have been able to predict that the icy water were gonna be very cold and that the ship could come into impact with potential collisions like icebergs. So had the ship uh, crashed into the iceberg and failed ductally, there is a chance the Titanic may have been able to handle the collision or at least buy more time for nearby boats to assist. So R&D groups can use this data to help determine brittle and ductile failures from impact testing. So how can we determine if a ship like the Titanic could have performed better under these frigid temperatures? And the answer is absorbed energy in joules. So note that the, the axis, on the Y axis, we have absorbed energy. And on the X axis, we have temperature. This, there is an important correlation between these two. As you can see, at low temps, the specimen does not absorb a lot of energy. And at high temps, you get much greater absorption. In this uh, case, for example, at negative 150, you absorb less than 20. And at 100 degrees Celsius, you are absorbing around 120 joules. So this, what is this transition zone that you see here in the middle? So our research and development groups will try and determine what this transition zone is so that they can identify an operable range of their product. So if we use the Titanic, for example, I would take this data and determine that the Titanic probably shouldn't be sailing in temperatures below zero degrees Celsius. You can see at around zero degrees in the circle there, the material starts to become brittle and drops in energy absorption rapidly. So I would either determine that the Titanic shouldn't be sailing or I would build a Titanic out of a different material that would fail more ductily around zero degrees. And before we move on, I just wanted to use a reminder that even though we're going to, we spent some time talking about the Titanic and referring to the brittleness of the material, it's important to remember some more frequent use cases like uh, car vehicles in the winter versus in the summer, airplanes maybe hitting a stray bird, and, and so on. So now that we've kind of grasped the importance of impact testing and how we properly analyze the energy data, we can look at how the test is performed. So the image on the left is a top-down view of the specimen in the inserts, and after placing the specimen in, the hammer strikes the unnotched side as you can see where the striking direction is. The right is a three-dimensional view. You can imagine the hammer is swinging down from the right to hit that specimen right in the back. The notch you see there in the middle is to encourage the break location similar to a reduced area in standard tensile testing. 
So now I'm going to show a brief little video of the impact test from a very close angle in one of our MPX frames. Just a moment while I pull it up. So here you can see the hammer. And then it swings through. There's no specimen in this video, just for the safety's sake. But here is a back view where we will insert the specimen. And then you will see the hammer swing down, break the specimen like that. So now I will resume the presentation. All right, so now that you've seen the Charpy test, I just wanted to briefly mention IZOD as well. IZOD is another common pendulum test, and both tests are performed to determine the impact energy. And although the setup is, uh, although the setup is slightly altered, the main difference between these two is how the specimen is oriented, where the striker hits the specimen and the location of the notch. You can see on the left here, the side is the side view of an IZOD test. You can see the the hammer still comes down from the right and hits the notch side. So IZOD helps determine cantilever failure, while Charpy tests produce uh, support failure. And whether or not to test Charpy or IZOD will largely depend on the standard that you are testing to, and as well as maybe the specimen dimensions, the notch type, or the material of your specimen. And just for example, um, some plastics is common for IZOD tests. So if you anticipate testing both Charpy and IZOD, it is important to consider the shape of your striker. So U-shaped strikers can perform both Charpy and IZOD while C-shaped strikers, and I'll show you an image right here, the C-shaped strikers require a full change of the hammer to be able to switch. This can be costly and very difficult to do. So again, if you do anticipate testing both, just something to keep in the back of your mind. And then there's just highlighting the C on the hammer. So we've seen the Charpy test and IZOB test, and we know why it's important. But now I want to talk about the results and the accuracy of them. The range of accuracy on your test will be largely di dictated by the standard you are testing to, so it's important to know what specs you should look for when thinking about a pendulum tester. So there's this large misconception that if my impact machine is rated for high energy breaks, then I can't test low energy specimens at the same time. I'll show you on the next slide why that doesn't have to be the case and you and how you can ask the right questions about your impact machine. So here's that image again. Early on, I asked you to keep in mind this large dial on the center of the frame. So, and I'm gonna explain why. The misconception about, you know, having a high capacity frame, not being able to test low capacity specimen comes from these physical dials that you may be familiar with on your impact testing machines. So the reason for this is because ASTM E23 states that the lower acceptable range is dictated by the scale or readout device. So because the operator has, oh, sorry about that. So because the operator has to physically read this dial, you're limited to not only what the physical eye can see, but the increments of the dial aren't gonna change on your impact machine. So we're gonna do a uh, very simplified exercise to help understand this, this lower resolution requirement. On the screen, we have two identical dials. Both start at zero and range to three. The only difference here is the amount of tick marks between each value. This is, this is what's called our, the resolution of our device. So ASTM E23 specifies the lower limit equal to 25 times the resolution of the scale or readout device. So if you look at our dial on the left, the value for each mark is 0 0.2. And on the right, we have 0 
If we need to define our lower range on the left, that would be 25 times 0 0.2, which is five joules. Now let's do the one on the right. We have 0 0.1 times 25, which is 2.5 joules. So hopefully the dials you're using aren't this poor resolution because you can't even use the one on the left because if your range is three, but you can only test five, then that's not very good for your testing. Um, but in this exercise, the one on the right is the dial or MPX machine that you'll want to use just because you can your range is better and you have a better resolution. But just to summarize, the more precise your dial, the lower you can test to. And then this brings us back to a more modern impact machine. So notice there's no dial on this machine as you saw on the other ones. And this is because standards allow us to use digital encoders instead of dials. So these dials, you know, they still obey all the standards. The only benefit is that you get higher accuracy readouts. And this is how you can future proof yourself with a high capacity machine and not have to worry about not being able to test your low energy specimens anymore. So now that we've kind of discussed the lower range, um, it's also important to understand the upper range as well. ASTM and ISO both classify this as 80% of your hammer energy. Uh, the reasoning for this is due to the linearity of your pendulum swing. So up until about 80% of your swing, you'll see on the graph here, you're very close to being a linear graph. But then after your pendulum strikes your specimen and goes through wind or windage loss and friction loss, your graph is a downward trend. And you can see the two lines here to kind of compare them. So this is the reason for the standards saying that, you know, you have to be, you can only test up to 80% of what your hammer energy is. And uh, it's just something to keep in mind because you wouldn't want to purchase a 450 joule machine and then find out you can only test 360 joule specimens if you were planning on testing specimens up to 400. So now that you know the two ranges, uh, here is a chart of just in Instron's pendulum impact capacities with the digital encoders we were referring to earlier. We have 300, 450, 600, 750, and 900. So for the lower range, this was the 25 times resolution. You can see even up to 900 joules, you can still test 1.1 joule specimens. And this is where that misconception is debunked uh, about not being able to test low while also having a high capacity or frame. And then upper range 80%, you can see here on the right just for a, a visual comparison. So these ranges are examples. Um, they've been verified through the Sharpie NIST program. Um, although the values of your upper and lower ranges will still need to be verified with each frame. So some details and factors to consider, and one of the most important in my opinion is safety. Uh, pendulum impact testing involves fast moving parts and it can seriously hurt someone if you're not careful. So this is one of the reasons that Sharpie manufacturers are moving on from manual test machines on the left here and sort of evolving into an enclosed and motorized solution like the one on the right. Some common safety challenges with the non-motorized, non-enclosed test frames, aside from you know large, fast-moving parts, you know hitting an operator and causing injury, um, it can be something as simple as uh, ergonometrics. Uh, if you have a frame bolted to the floor, like a lot of the manual ones on the left here are, your test is combining or colliding with your specimen around your ankle height. So in order to reinsert new specimens, you have to bend over you know, frequently depending on how many tests you're doing. And this can certainly cause strain to your operator over time. Um, and also, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with this if you've used one of these manual frames, is in order to latch the hammer back into this upward position, a lot of operators will physically catch the hammer when it's swinging back. And you know you you have your hands in in the vicinity of moving parts. Also, when that hammer comes down to catch it, you know over time that can certainly cause some force on like your shoulder or the arm over time. It's just something to keep in mind if you're considering an impact frame. It's uh, safety and ergonometrics. 
So some more tips to help overcome challenges in impact testing is throughput. It's fairly common to have to have to manually calibrate your impact test for windage and friction loss, and then factor in those data points in your results um, every time you're doing a sample. Uh, also, retrieving data on whether your specimen was you know, passed or failed based on the criteria that you may be setting or that you're setting based on the standard you're testing to. Uh, this is just something, uh, you know, if you don't, you won't have to worry about if you decide to, you know, migrate towards a more uh, automated solution for your impact testing. And we're going to talk about efficiency for your frames. Uh, you remember briefly I talked about having to bend over many times to insert your specimen. So a solution to this might be lifting your system up to make it more ergonometric. ergonometric. So I'm just going to show a, a, a brief little video. So you can see here this frame is uh, located right at arms, arms height. You can load the specimen, open the door, And then close it. And there's a, depending on your machine, your machine, there may be a feature to increase your efficiency by starting the test as soon as your door is closed. All right, so we'll continue on. Okay, so. We're going to wrap up what we learned today, go through a summary of what we went through. Uh, number one, impact testing machines and the results we also looked at in Remember the Story of Titanic and analyzed its events from the perspective of impact testing. We've looked at some detailed information on ASTM and ISO standards about the acceptable ranges that you can test to. And we've also looked at some tips to remember to help with efficient and uh, thorough testing and also main, staying safe while you're testing. So thank you all for listening to this presentation. Uh, now we have some time for questions. If anyone has any, uh, it will be asked by Stefan. Thank you, JJ. That's great. Uh, yeah, we got a couple questions in, and uh, yeah, I'm just going to start reading them out. Uh, I'll read one question after another, and then you can just go and answer them. Um, so the first one we got in was, I've heard about NIST associated with Charpy testing. What is that, and how does it differ from ASTM or ISO? Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, NIST verification is sort of like a, a gold standard um, when you're getting your machine professionally verified. Um, this is a very thorough program that NIST has for Charpy testing and it uses indirect verification. So what they do is they they precisionly machine these specimens internally, you know, document them and then they send them to you to run on your impact tester. And then after you test your specimens, you'll send them back to NIST and then based on how the specimens broke, they can determine some things like how aligned your system are or your system is, if your supports are worn or you know you need to fine tune any parts of your machine like the hammer or your strikers. Um, and then after they determine all these, they will send you a like a verification sticker with your lower range and whether or not you pass the NIST program. Good question. Thank you. Okay, the next question was, you mentioned that changing to an ISO test setup versus a Charpy test setup could be costly. Can you explain that? Yeah, so another good question. Um, if you remember um, early on, we were talking about U and C-shaped strikers. And uh, if you, you can see kind of on the left here, we we have a, a a U-shaped striker. Um, this is, and so the reason that it can be costly is because if you remember the IZOD striker, uh, you have your specimen oriented vertically. So the C would collide with your supports 
if you were to test Iza with a C shape. So that being said, you would need to swap out your whole arm and hammer, which depending if you have service do it and uh, to reinstall it, it can certainly be cost costly and take some time for sure. Good question. Thank you. Next one was, if I were to purchase an impact tester, do I need to worry about the foundation requirements to meet ASTM or ISO standards? Yeah, thanks for that. That's a good question. Um, so a lot of uh, older impact testers are mounted to the floor. This is it's totally fine. You can pass all these standards if you if you mount your system to the floor. Um, but again, you deal with the challenge of being non-ergonometric, and a lot of people want to raise that up. If that's the case, uh, the requirement to meet these standards is that you just want to be uh, you want your foundation to be 40 times your hammer weight. And then you can work with your provider to you know, talk about those details and how to get that mounted. But it's very common to mount your system up on a, a mounting block. Thank you. The next question was, do manual systems pass today's safety standards? And I think they mean like a system that you built with like the big round dial earlier. Yeah, a good question. You know, we certainly recommend that you, you know, perform your own internal safety audit. Um, but in terms of passing standards, um, you know, we can't speak for other providers, but um, a common machine safety standard that I can think of is uh, ISO 13849. Uh, I believe that's um, machine moving parts standard. Uh, the MPX does comply to this standard. Um, but again, we can't, you know, speak for other, or just non, or motorizing closed systems just in general. A good question. Thank you. Uh, the next question was, I've seen multiple different notch types on Sharpie specimens. Why would I need to worry about different notch types? Yeah, so um, the notch type of your Sharpie specimen is dependent on the material of your specimen. Um, for most cases, the 45 degree V style design, which you can maybe see here in these images, um, it's enough to encourage the break and you know physically break your specimen. But you know there are cases uh, where you know maybe that's not enough and most of the cases it's more ductile specimens uh, will require a deeper notch to further encourage that break and that's when you'll see uh, sometimes you might see a u notch or a keyhole style notch uh, it's just dependent on your specimen material you want it you know you know analyze it um, depending if how your results come out good question Thank you. We have another one in here, which is, can modern impact machines lift the hammer for operators? How does that work and how is it safer than older systems? Yeah, so um, modern motorized is a keyword, uh, do automatically lift the hammer for you. Uh, older ones, you may have seen the pictures uh, earlier in the slides. Um, and it also it depends on who you're getting your system from, but for the most case, it's not motorized. And what they'll do is they'll catch it to latch it. So if if you want your machine to automatically latch itself, you know, keyword is motorized. Good question. Okay, great. Um, so we had one question come in here uh, while you were explaining the Sharpie versus ISOT, and the question was, do you get the same results from both tests? Yeah, for the most part, yeah, the result that you're obtaining is absorbed energy. You know, both of these tests give you that result. Um, you're determining whether or not to do ISOT versus Sharpie. Again, number one is mostly the standard that you're testing to, um, but also there are some benefits. Um, again, it could be the hammer type. If you bought a C-shaped hammer, you're, you're gonna be limited to Sharpie. Um, 
or if you're testing multiple specimens um, or like specimen types like metal or plastic, uh, IZOD is, is common for plastic as well. But yeah, for, to summarize, absorbed energy is the, the results that you're looking for. Thank you. During the resolution piece, you were explaining the dials, um, and there was a question there about where does the factor of 25 come from? And I think that's in regards to 25 times the resolution of your testing uh, testing machine. Yeah, so the, the 25 times is, it comes straight from the standard for ASTM E23. Um, and so it's the, the full standard says 25 times the resolution at 15 joules. Uh, the, the reasoning for the 15 joules, if, if you remember kind of like older weight scales, you know, zero to 100, uh, is scaled evenly, but everything after you might go up to 600, and the scale is way off. So that's kind of where the 15 joules comes from. Uh, so, but the 25 is is just what's dictated in the standard. Thank you. I think that makes perfect sense. Um, we have another question here that came in about: Can you define windage and friction losses? And I think that was during your presentation. You had a piece on that. Yep, yeah, so um, in a perfect world, when you break a specimen, you only want to know, you know, how much energy it took to break that specimen. But when your hammer is swinging down to achieve the velocity that you're looking for, um, you know, you're, you're going to have wind loss just from um, the hammer, you know, blowing through the air and also friction loss that can one come through the wind. Also, you lose some friction energy when you break the specimen as the specimen is being forced out of the supports. There's a little bit of energy loss in that friction. So important to calibrate your machine. You can do it on manual and automated. If you, you, know, you run your test and based on how much energy it calculated without any specimen inserted, that's how you, you, know, you take that into account your results. Good question. Thank you. Um, there's another question here. Is the energy adjustable for a given frame? Yeah, so depending on your provider, um, you may or may not be able to. Uh, so if, for example, we'll use the 750 option MPX that Instrom provides, you can, you can change your, your fins, which is what make up the U design. Uh, to be a smaller weight, and you, you can do that to get more precise precision if you do want to get further down than what your machine is rated to. For the most part, um, the encoder allows us to test down to very low values, but you can certainly change out your equipment if you want to get even more precise than that. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, we have one here which is. Uh, it's about how the specimens are made, specifically the notches. So you can, uh, there are options. You can mill your specimens yourself. You can buy a, a miller, uh, which is, you know, just a device to notch your specimen. Or you can, you know, through the, or the NIST verification program, you can purchase specimens. And, you know, it's a very fine precision um, technique and procedure that they go through if you want to notch your specimens. Thank you. And there was like one, I think I'm just going to try to answer this one quickly, uh, which was a follow-up on the notching. If Instron is providing notching machines with reliable knives, and I can tell you we, we definitely provide the knives, but we're not providing like a machine specifically for the notching, but we definitely have the notch cutters, so like the, the knives that you're referring to here. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, you can get in touch with one of our sales representatives and uh, they can surely help you out there. Okay, so I think that's uh, most of the questions that we can answer here during the webinar. And uh, I think we're gonna take the other ones offline and uh, yeah, we'll
follow up with you guys on the rest of the questions. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks for wrapping up. Um, before we go today, just want to you know give you a reminder to check out our webinar we're hosting next week on impact testing on high performance materials and that'll be next week and so be sure to check that out thank you everyone oh um so yeah i know everyone's kind of falling out now but um yeah i just want to wrap up real quick a couple couple quick items um so for those questions not addressed live today we'll be sure to follow up with those individuals by email um, and we'll also send you a link where you can view the recording and get the slide deck and then um, in addition to the impact testing webinar that jj just mentioned i also want to mention we have an additional webinar coming up on june 29th with dan and meredith from our low force applications team uh, they're going to be here to discuss tips for simpler and safer testing in quality control environments i'm going to drop a link into chat now i've already got one in there for the other impact testing webinar if you're interested this one will be for the quality control um, webinar coming up on june 29th so with that said i just want to thank uh, jj for presenting today great job jj and thanks so much stefan for keeping an eye on questions and also thanks to all of you for attending. We do really appreciate your time and for everyone that submitted questions. Um, stay healthy, everyone. We hope to see you again next time.